Welcome to System Change. This is the seventh presentation in a seven-part series. This is Jan Spencer in Eugene, Oregon. The ideal for this series of presentations is to encourage forward movement towards a society that lives within the boundaries of the natural world and brings out the best and positive human potential. Also, an economic system that is honest, accountable, and serves the healthy goals of a healthy society and the restoration of the natural world. All the previous presentations are now on YouTube. There's a good deal of text in this presentation, so what you see in the upper left-hand corner is a little indication to pause when you see the pause. You can pause watching on YouTube to take a closer look at the content on that slide. This is a listing with links to the previous presentations. They're all on YouTube. And during this presentation, I will make reference to these earlier presentations. They all fit together and this presentation will be a lot more understandable, a lot richer in content if you see the other presentations. This presentation will take some time. Depends somewhat on how much time the viewer cares to spend with it. There's an enormous amount of information. I strongly suggest pausing when you see the pause. We live in a unique, tiny speck of history. What we consider normal is a near full court press of social engineering, a project known as the consumer culture. The timeline is just to provide a sense of just how short our experience is in modern times within the longer timeline of human history. This slide simply compares how humans have taken care of basic needs throughout history. The take-home message being that our needs at this point are far more energy and resource intensive. The convenience and affluence most Americans expect has created a lot of problems for people and planet. Our affluence and expectations are only a speck of time. Why are we here? We certainly enjoy a lot of benefits from our affluence and convenience, but at the same time, the common denominators of almost every social, economic, public health, political, and environmental problem we're familiar with is a result of our affluence, our convenience, and our overconsumption of resources and energy. At this point in history, we would be smart to reconsider how we define our needs and how we take care of them. An increasing number of people and organizations are pushing back. The purpose of this presentation is to encourage healthy and creative pushing back against capitalism and the consumer culture. This flowchart will present itself at each section of the presentation. The start, the need to downsize, then individuals downsize at home and nearby, then organizations, then progressive candidates. I suggest pausing for a few moments here to have a good look at the flowchart. It's very dynamic. Each one of these sections is a pushback against capitalism, and they all support each other. The mainstream economy values buying, selling, and consuming over the well-being of people and planet. Capitalism certainly has many critics. Please spend a minute or two looking at these particular aspects of capitalism and the consumer culture. 
This is a closer look at the common denominator analogy. Virtually every nonprofit activist group, a movement that works on behalf of social, political, economic fair play, and public health, a green natural world, virtually all of these progressive organizations are addressing a problem caused by capitalism and the consumer culture. What if they realized they were all on the same team and decided to synchronize with each other? On behalf of helping to create an eco footprint is a way to measure the damage human activity imposes on the natural world. It's a very useful tool. You can take a survey at the website shown below, the footprint calculator. The calculator will ask you a number of questions about lifestyle, about diet, about transportation, how you live. When you finish the survey, the calculator will tell you how many planet Earths would be required for everybody on planet Earth to live like you. The results may come as a shock. The average American has a five planet Earth footprint, the largest footprint in the world. So the footprint is a very useful tool for determining our footprints and motivating us and informing us, educating us about the need to downsize our ecological footprint. That means using less resources and energy. That's what this presentation is about. This map shows the ecological footprint for the average citizen of almost every country in the world. Even affluent countries in Western Europe and Japan have substantially smaller ecological footprints than the United States. This graphic compares a five-Earth economy in the United States with a one-Earth economy. Kind of striking how much smaller a sustainable economy would look like. Reducing the size of the United States economy is not an idea embraced by everybody. There's no question a downsized economy would have enormous consequences. The question should present itself, who decides what kind of an economy we have and what are the goals of that economy? In this next section, we'll take a short look at what a one earth lifestyle might look like and also some of the benefits. Reducing our ecological footprints is a critical action for moving towards a society and economy that lives within its environmental boundaries. Again, the degree of downsizing that is called for would be remarkable. We're talking more than recycling, riding a bike, and eating tofu. This is a return to the footprint calculator and an actual calculation based on a real person's answers to the survey questions. The description in green represents what a approximate one earth lifestyle can look like. A one earth lifestyle doesn't mean one fifth the amount of food, one fifth the amount of shelter, or one fifth the amount of education. There could be many, many benefits with downsizing. Climate change, ecological trends, political, economic, social trends are all telling us we can't continue with the current direction of resource consumption. Voluntary downsizing is a much better choice than not voluntary downsizing. The perspectives from this presentation are certainly from a middle class experience. Important to add, just as our economic system and consumer culture creates many environmental problems, 
It also creates very many equity, social, political problems. And we're going to take a look at approaches to resolving many of those issues as we continue with our presentation. One of the most important actions to take in transition from affluence to downsizing is what do we do with our time and our money? Using our time and money in a way that helps advance the cause of downsizing and paradigm shift is a critical and essential choice to make, both at the individual level and at the society level as well. For many people, downsizing can lead to more time to be engaged in community building. The city of Spokane, Washington, has a phrase they like to use, you don't have to move to live in a better neighborhood. Many cities have neighborhood associations, and these are wonderful places to become involved. This is a very nice comparison between the consumer culture and a one-earth ecological culture. Very simplified, but a good place to pause for a short time. What you'll notice here is that some of these transformations are home-based, they're lifestyle-based, but many of these transformations go beyond the capacity of a person or their neighbors. It enters a realm that there needs to be a much larger scale for transformation. That's what we're going to look at next. Capitalism and the consumer culture are not allies for helping to create a resilient and sustainable future. An increasing number of people are reducing their ecological footprints, but that number needs to grow a lot. At the same time, there are thousands of progressive organizations that have the capacity to play a major role in helping to bring about a preferred future and their members who are already savvy to downsizing can tell the leaders of those organizations just how they can play that important role with bringing about a preferred future. When you think of many of the nation's progressive organizations, they address a wide range of issues, including the environment, public health, social and economic justice, electoral politics, labor, peace, foreign policy, and as mentioned, the common denominator with most of these progressive organizations is they are addressing some kind of issue, some kind of damage caused by overconsumption and the consumer culture. In a sense, all these progressive organizations are on the same team. Reducing our ecological footprints reduces the damage, and it also reduces the political, economic power of these unaccountable large businesses. Downsizing is essentially a boycott, and these progressive organizations can encourage their members and their supporters to join that boycott. In earlier presentations in this series, I made comments about the new movement that already exists. What I mean by that is the movement to create a more green, resilient, healthy planet is a movement. There are thousands of organizations, millions of people who are working on exactly this, whether they think of it as a movement or not, it certainly deserved to be thought of as a movement. And considering it a movement, I think, is really empowering. And certainly downsizing our lifestyles in a purposeful way can take this movement to a whole new level. Organizations can be an enormously important part of this new level of activism when these organizations realize how downsizing eco-footprints can be a big help with the work they do. 
And when they add to their own activism the idea of reaching out to their own supporters, their own members, to encourage them to downsize, and even beyond that, providing their members and the people who support them with useful information, kind of a how-to guide to downsize and to coordinate with other organizations. I think this movement can really energize. Let's just take a closer look at this new movement that already exists. It really is expansive. We see here quite a wide variety of categories of interest. This movement is a lot more than progressive nonprofits. We see here only a few of the more activist oriented parts of this movement that already exists. There's indigenous activism, there's Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, the Climate March, and these are only a few. In my opinion, they're all pushing back against the consumer culture and capitalism. Here's more categories. Just pause for a moment and take a closer look. Still more categories. They are all on the same team. Two more slides with the actual names of organizations. You'll recognize a lot of these. And many of these organizations have chapters all over the country. We're looking at millions of people here. You'll recognize quite a few of the names on this slide. And the Sierra Club claims close to 4 million members and supporters. That's serious amount of movement there, especially if we can activate at the next level. There's lots of other organizations that are not overtly political, but all these organizations exist to improve our communities in some way or another. So I think that qualifies them for being on the same team. A little bit of outreach, a little bit of creating working relationships, and this movement can expand enormously. City programs like Neighborhood Watch, Mapping Your Neighborhood, CERT, these are prime locations to connect with people who are interested in well-being, in resilience, in prepared communities. I mentioned that progressive organizations could provide their supporters, their membership, even the general public with educational content that could actually help people understand what they can do in their own lives for downsizing and also explaining why downsizing is so important for the community and for the planet. Please have a look, especially if you are involved with an organization, political or not. One could even consider the information here in this presentation as being useful for a guide for uh, sharing with the general public. I would certainly welcome anyone taking this info and putting it to good use, putting it out to a wider audience. One of the first actions I would ask people to do in a downsizing guide would be to explain the importance of how we prioritize our time and our money. I would also include an explanation about permaculture, a holistic design system that can be applied to a remarkable variety of topics, issues, circumstances. I explained a lot of these images in earlier presentations. I like the idea of expanding the context into the movement realm. The following images all come from real life and can be adapted to lots of other circumstances. 
These actually are images of a preferred future. We just need to expand the number of these kinds of projects and places. This is another property in Eugene, one of my favorite suburban permaculture locations and friendly neighborhood. It's an awesome site, and not only does it provide lots of valuable production for the people who live here, they use it as an educational resource, have people over and do a show and tell so those people can learn how to do this kind of suburban permaculture where they live. Another thought to add about transforming suburbia, some people would like to do this kind of restoration, this kind of suburban repair on their own, like Matt and Jessica at this location. But imagine millions of suburban properties all over the country where the owners don't have the time or the expertise to make this kind of transformation, but they've got the money to pay other people to do it. Transforming suburbia is an enormous opportunity for eco-friendly economic development. East Blair Housing Co-op is located in Eugene and it's one of my favorite locations to show and tell ecological lifestyle at the neighborhood level. The co-op owns about eight properties, and it can manage those properties in a synchronized way. That means they don't have to have 15 washing machines. They have a shared tool space. The image in the upper left-hand corner used to be a parking lot. And, of course, many people come here to visit to see what the co-op looks like. Can you imagine if this was just a normal location in any neighborhood? These are several more images from East Blair. You can see their tool room, lots of different tools that people in the co-op can use. You don't have to have all your own tools, much smaller eco footprint. Part of the co-op is fairly densely residential, so people in that part don't have room to have a garden close to where they live, but other co-op properties have more space, so people can have a garden area only a couple minutes walking away. East Blair also has a community house for social occasions. It's really very much a low-cost co-housing retrofit is East Blair. A guide to downsizing could include information explaining to people how they could adapt the different kinds of benefits and actions at East Blair to their own home and neighborhood. It doesn't have to be a legal housing co-op. Neighbors could just collaborate this way on their own. No permission needed. I think it's safe to say that neighborhood associations are at the base of the civic pyramid. I'm on the board of my neighborhood association, and it's just been one of the most enriching experiences of my life. Many cities have neighborhood programs. When you're involved with the neighborhood association, you help set the agenda, and that agenda can include downsizing and permaculture. Again, a guidebook to downsizing could include all kinds of information about connecting with a neighborhood association or neighborhood program. Friendly Neighborhood is a very active neighborhood here in Eugene. They're a great example to show what neighbors can do when they repurpose time, money. Residents in the neighborhood constructed this wonderful neighborhood garden on public property. It's a real center of green activity in friendly neighborhood. They have work parties, learning sessions, participation. A lot of community building goes on here. A downsizing guide would share stories so other people could learn how they could apply this kind of initiative to their own neighborhoods. The downsizing Eco Footprint Guide could include a section explaining how to organize a bike tour. 
once you have three or four or five permaculture transformation projects in your neighborhood, it's great fun to get on a bike with a bunch of other people and go check them out and have the person living there at that property explain what they've done. It makes people on the tour want to do the same. This is my neighborhood. You can see the Willamette River over on the right. The white X is actually my place. All along the river is public property. And thanks to our neighborhood association, we have a a relationship with the city and we actually help take care of the greenway that public space along the river a number of people in the neighborhood including myself have actually adopted sections of the greenway for habitat restoration removing invasive species and just general upkeep note the title filbert grove this is a close-up of the Filbert Grove. We've had a collaboration with the city for over 10 years to restore this Filbert Grove. The Filbert Grove predates the Greenway. This used to be private property, and when it became public property, the Filbert Grove was included. For years, it languished, overgrown, blackberries, English ivy. It was a real mess. And we started a relationship with the city. The city has a program to help empower people in the neighborhoods to make improvements in their neighborhoods. The city has resources that are helpful for neighbors. The city shouldn't have to do everything. And a restoration of the Filbert Grove is just a wonderful example of a collaboration between residents of the city and the city. A sustainable society and economy will require people, will require citizens to take on more responsibilities of all kinds. These pictures are from Portland, Oregon. And they highlight a wonderful organization named City Repair. City Repair is all about placemaking. It's all about repairing the city. It's all about empowering people to take more initiative where they live. That's what placemaking is all about, is creating interesting features in the neighborhood that say there are people here who care about where they live. So a downsizing guidebook would explain these kinds of approaches of placemaking and community building. This presentation and point of view just cannot overemphasize how important it is for people to take time out of their own lives and become engaged in their communities to make them better places to live. Prioritizing our time and money is just essential for creating a sustainable, resilient, peaceful, green society, economy, neighborhood, and home. Block planning is a land use tool. It's called block planning in Eugene. It could have a different name in other locations, but it's a land use tool where people who own property on a block, where the residents of the block, the neighborhood association would be involved, the city would certainly be involved, but it's creating a plan for reworking the block, reworking the streets, the properties, the landscape. A block plan doesn't make city regulations go away, but complying with those regulations becomes much more flexible and that means a block plan can make much better use of on-site infrastructure resources. A block plan doesn't turn the block into a commune. People maintain their private property, but a little bit like what happened I explained earlier with East Blair Housing Co-op, block planning can help bring about a much more effective use of urban space and assets available, the people, the landscape, the economy. City governments empowering their citizens to take the initiative to improve their quality of lives 
is a critical part of moving towards sustainability. Electing progressive electoral candidates to create the policies and create the budgets should be a high priority for all progressive organizations, movements, and citizens. New York City's Community Plaza program is a great example of empowering citizens all over the city to create places like you see here in these pictures. Reclaiming automobile space for people. A citizen's sustainability guide would include information about how to turn automobile space into bike space. Oftentimes, car lanes are wider than they need to be. Oftentimes, cars don't need to park on the street. Educated and motivated citizen advocates can help their communities reduce eco-footprints by turning car space into safe biking space. Most cities have community centers. These are wonderful places where nearby neighbors, citizens, can enjoy the amenities to exercise, take classes, build community with programs for all age groups. Community centers are perfect locations for classes, events, and activities where people can learn about reducing their eco footprints. We hosted the 2015 Northwest Permaculture Convergence at our suburban neighborhood recreation center. Empowering young people has to be a high priority for moving towards sustainability. Two other very important constituencies have a big part to play in bringing about sustainability and a preferred future. Those are faith groups and seniors. Please take a closer look. These pictures show a church about a mile from where I live, and this church has a couple acres of property, and on part of that property they've built a market garden where they grow enough food to actually have a farm stand out in their parking lot along a busy suburban street. Many churches, mosques, synagogues have property. They could empower their own members to put that property into productive use, or they could invite nearby neighbors or civic organizations to use that property for growing food. This church is only a couple blocks from where I live, and they have a partnership with the local NAACP. I recently learned about this faith network in Northern Virginia that counts over 70 diverse faith groups as members. They have a wide range of outreach, both to their own constituencies, but also local and state governments. Their focus is climate change, but of course, that's a very broad topic in terms of what to do about climate change. It's absolutely crucial to begin creating these kinds of networks. And it's for sure, as conditions require, networks, individuals, organizations will become more ambitious with their agendas. For sure, our efforts to bring about sustainability are going to require making more creative use of existing assets and allies such as the electoral system and the candidates who run for office. Just imagine in our ideal scenario if organizations and individuals are gaining synchronized actions for promoting, advocating, educating about sustainability with these actions and outreach gaining more traction, that also means greater support for electoral candidates with a more ambitious platform on behalf of downsizing, sustainability, and paradigm shift. But running for office is not only about winning the election. The electoral arena can serve also as an enormous classroom 
to bring sustainability, downsizing, and paradigm shift ideas to a much wider audience. Please take a closer look at the text here. Progressive candidates could be extremely powerful messenger. Economics and politics are intimately related. At the present time, big business and big money have a disproportionate influence on both the political and economic systems. From this perspective, that big business, big money control of the political and economic systems is the source of the majority of our social, economic, political, and environmental challenges. The ideal of political and economic democracy is to repair that relationship of influence. Basically, who controls the economic and political system? Big money or the well-being of people and planet? Please have a good look at the content here, and you can always research more and learn more about political and economic democracy. Policies and budgets at the state and federal level can make a lot of difference at the local level. Redeveloping our cities and towns is an example. If state and federal policies and their budgets included redeveloping strip malls like this one, we could make our neighborhoods much more walkable, reduce our eco footprints, and improve public health all at the same time. Parking lots very well may be the new frontier in urban planning. This 10-acre parking lot could become a micro-downtown for the surrounding neighborhoods with higher density residential and more commercial and professional services closer to where people live to reduce the need for driving. Policies and budgets at local, state, and federal level can help our cities and towns become healthier and, and more friendly to people and planet. Those policies and budgets all depend on progressive candidates and those progressive candidates being supported by progressive people and progressive organizations and movements. The city of Copenhagen, Denmark, has plans for an impressive set of bicycle expressways between the suburbs and downtown because they have priorities in their budgets and their policies to improve the safety and desirability of traveling by bicycle. Barcelona, Spain is perhaps my favorite urban restoration story. The intention with the superblocks and the rest of the mobility plan is to improve air quality, reduce ambient noise, improve public health overall. The entire superblock concept, the municipal elections in France during the summer of 2020, show the importance of progressive candidates for local elections. Green Party mayor candidates or mayor candidates endorsed by the Green Party won elections in Paris, Marseille, Lyon, Bordeaux, Strasbourg, Grenoble, and smaller cities. In general, the platforms for all these candidates included pushing back on cars, creating more walkable and bikeable communities, improving public transit, developing brown fields instead of green fields, energy conservation, planting trees, and moving towards more local production of important products and services. The results of those ambitious platforms, of course, remain to be seen, but it's notable that the movement that already exists seems to be a good deal further along in France. Safe to say, the electoral system in France is more democratic than what we have here in the United States. 
programs, budgets, and policies for reducing our eco footprints need to make their way out into rural areas as well. Certainly, smaller scale organic farming, more localized all over the country, should be a high priority at the local, state, and federal level. Healthy small cities and towns are an essential part of a sustainable society and economy. The sooner we begin educating for a downsized future, the better. Engaging young people in community service by teaching civics for a sustainable future should be a high priority. Environmental restoration should be a key part of every progressive candidate's political electoral platform. Half of Americans live in suburbia, and repurposing the suburban social, political, economic landscape can help suburbia reduce its ecological footprint and produce more of its basic needs right there where people live. The term public option is often used to refer to a form of managed health care. A public option can also be applied to a wide range of services. Like public parks, public schools, public libraries, a public defender, public transportation, a public option is a good or a product made available as a provision by a government. It can compete with private products and services. It coexists with private products and services. It doesn't replace them, but it provides an alternative with a variety of benefits. A public option can create an alternative to a flawed marketplace. A public option is available to everyone. It can be more accountable to the public. A public option can bring diverse people together, like schools, parks, and libraries. Financial services could be a public option that could enhance the quality of life in a neighborhood or community. A public option bank could have a charter that requires it to make loans that specifically produce benefits to the environment and community well-being. Our 42nd Avenue is not specifically a public option, but a public option bank could bring about projects and community benefits just like our 42nd Ave. A public option bank could loan money to small entrepreneurs to create businesses with services and products that can help bring about a more sustainable community. A public option bank could provide loans to unusual projects like turning a rundown apartment complex into an eco village. Public options are nothing new and they can be a powerful tool for moving our society and economy in a more democratic and sustainable direction. The presentation is on the home stretch. We are now to the bottom of the flow chart. The best part. Electoral politics offer an immense amount of potential and opportunity for sharing progressive ideals with a wider audience. And note, joining your neighborhood association is a great place to start. The act of moving towards paradigm shift is a timely investment in a preferred future. That's a lot of information. Please share this presentation with others. It's all very common sense. I fully believe that positive human potential is our greatest renewable resource. This is a listing with links to the previous presentations. They're all on YouTube. 
And during this presentation, I will make reference to these earlier presentations. They all fit together. And this presentation will be a lot more understandable, a lot richer in content if you see the other presentations. And here are just a few more related thoughts. A few thoughts and comments. A sustainable future will have to come to terms with a non-sustainable present. There is a small but very significant and appreciated increase in progressive journalism. Americans can be exceptional and downsizing can bring out the best in all of us. The final slide. Please join us for this series of awesome conversations beginning in January. Please make a screen grab of the schedule and send the file to your friends and networks. Thanks. Thank you for your interest. We do have many allies and assets for moving towards a preferred future. And please share this presentation with your friends, your allies, colleagues. Thanks. All the best.